Donald Trump's unhinged White House trade advisor, Peter Navarro, was found guilty of contempt of Congress on Thursday. He literally blew through $1 million in legal fees for his, what, his day in court, and most importantly, the big press conference after the verdict. That's what he was hoping for. It didn't go well. He didn't get his his $1 million worth. It was a disaster. So if you stay with me this morning, you'll learn why you should never spend $1 million you don't have on lawyers, why it's always better just to answer a congressional subpoena. And I'll explain what exactly Peter Navarro was convicted of on Thursday and why it's going to be a problem for Donald Trump. I'll also make sure you're never, ever, ever confused again by terms like executive privilege or contempt of Congress. But first, this is the mop-up for September 8th, 2023. The government's new fiscal year begins on October 1st, and yet there's no budget, which means to avoid a shutdown, Congress must approve a continuing resolution. It's a short-term budget deal that would, you know, keep things going for a while. Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer is attempting to paint House Republicans in a corner by making them appear unreasonable, not that hard to accomplish that. That's pretty much why House Republicans were sent to Washington, to to be unreasonable. Democrat Chuck Schumer is reportedly getting cooperation from Senate Minority Leader Mitch McConnell, who has signaled he wants to pass a short-term budget resolution to keep things going. It puts Speaker Kevin McCarthy in a tough situation. He's got a couple of weeks to decide, will he be reasonable or will he cave to the MAGA wing of his caucus and begin impeachment proceedings against Joe Biden to get the votes he needs to seem reasonable and prevent a showdown? So Kevin McCarthy's getting a lot of pushback in the House. And Mitch McConnell Well, he doesn't really have the support of his caucus in the Senate. After freezing in public for the second time this summer, there are already Senate Republicans saying it's time for the 80-year-old Kentucky senator to step down. Here is the odious Republican senator from Missouri, Josh Hawley, after he was asked whether or not McConnell still has what it takes. Uh, Do I think he should be a leader? No. Republicans, I got to hand it to you, they don't march in lockstep, probably because they're too busy marching in goose step. They are fascists and fascists goose step. Mitch McConnell's physician gave him a clean bill of health and blamed the two freeze-ups this summer on dehydration. Here is Republican Senator Rand Paul, who, like Mitch McConnell, represents the grading state of Kentucky. I think it's an inadequate explanation to say this is dehydration. Okay, because you're an ophthalmologist, it's Dr. Rand Paul. So uh, what's your 2020 hindsight on his condition? Well, I've practiced medicine for 25 years, and it Uh doesn't look like dehydration to me. It looks like a focal neurologic event. Wow. So you've practiced medicine for 20 years, and nobody ever told you that as a doctor, it's unethical to administer a diagnosis based on what you saw on television. Wait, did I just say unethical? I'm sorry. Rand Paul's a Republican. Why would I use unethical Uh, Well, you could use unethical and Rand Paul in the same sentence, actually. Uh, Continue, Dr. Rand Paul. What did you think when you saw your colleague, Senator Mitch McConnell, freeze up? Wow, this looks like a seizure. (laughs) Well, does somebody have uh, tissues for Senator Rand Paul? He seems very upset by his friend uh, having a a seizure. Continue. Seizure. 
seizure, <laughs> seizure, yeah. seizure, seizure, yeah. Yeah. seizure. It's it's very seizure. funny. He's laughing. Very funny. You know, when it comes to medical advice, Rand Paul is the first guy I would turn to. If every other doctor, nurse practitioner, chiropractor, massage therapist, and tarot card reader were wiped out in a nuclear holocaust, because this is the same respected member of the medical community who said he wouldn't give his own children the COVID vaccine. But in all fairness, Dr. Rand Paul believes the vaccine is perfectly safe. He just wants his children to die. We're tracking Hurricane Lee. Hurricane Lee, which also happens to be the name back in the 1950s of Gypsy Rose Lee's gay stripper brother. It's just getting worse. I don't even know who Gypsy Lee Rose is. Anyway, Hurricane Lee started Thursday morning as a Category 1 and finished the day as a Category 4 and is expected to become become a Category 5 later this morning. What an ambitious little prick. All in basically 24 hours. You know what, Lee? I hated you as a Category 1. I'm going to hate you even more as a Category 5. And no, I won't respect you once you get the Hurricane 5 belt. Yeah, I'll fear you, but I won't respect you because everyone knows you're just overcompensating for your own sense of inadequacy. Real hurricanes don't need to prove how tough they are by becoming hurricane fours or fives. They stay at ones, right? And, you know, it's not really a hurricane five. Hurricane Lee, you're juicing, okay? You're drinking from the Atlantic. There should be an asterisk next to Hurricane Lee's name, because everyone knows the Atlantic Ocean is the hottest it's ever been. And the hotter the ocean, the more intense the hurricanes. Lee is juicing. You want to be a five? Uh, you know, anyone can be a five off the coast of Puerto Rico. It's the, it's the Bush League. Go down south below the equator where it's winter, and then we'll see what you got. Try becoming a Hurricane Five in colder temperatures. Otherwise, sit the F down, Lee. Lee is projected to hit Puerto Rico and Haiti possibly by the end of the weekend when this probably won't be <laughs> as funny as I thought it might have been. Probably wasn't funny just now, but I have a feeling it's going to be a lot less funnier if such a thing is possible when this hits landfall. Scientologist Danny Masterson was sentenced to 30 years in prison on Thursday. The Scientologist Danny Masterson, who is a Scientologist, was found guilty of raping two women back in May. He is a Scientologist. Leah Remini, a former Scientologist and vocal opponent of Scientology, issued the following statement after Danny Masterson was sentenced. She said, quote, over the past seven decades, former Scientologists have sadly become used to Scientology, using its financial resources, religious protection, and relationships to snatch justice away from them. For over two decades, Danny Masterson avoided accountability for his crimes. While Danny was the only one sentenced, his conviction and sentence are indictments against Scientology, its operatives, and its criminal leader, David Miscavige. Meanwhile, convicted rapist Donald Trump has been ordered to pay his victim E. Jean Carroll, $5 million, after a jury found him liable for rape and defamation. A second defamation trial for Donald Trump is scheduled in January, the same day as the Iowa caucuses. The judge in the second trial is the same judge from the first trial, and he issued a summary judgment earlier this week ruling Trump guilty. He's guilty of rape. He's guilty of defamation. And the judge, Judge Kaplan, said there's no need for a trial to determine whether or not Donald Trump defamed 
E. Jean Carroll again, or raped her, he's guilty. So we're going to have a trial just to figure out how much more E. Jean Carroll is owed in damages. So far, Trump owes her $5 million. And in January, there's an, another jury will decide how much more she's entitled to. A new biography of Elon Musk says the world's richest man stopped a Ukrainian drone attack on Russian troops by refusing to provide satellite service for the mission. According to this new book, right after Russia invaded Ukraine, Musk learned that the Ukrainian military was going to launch a drone attack on Russian warships off the coast of Crimea. Musk, who owns the Starlink satellite network, which he has been providing free to the Ukrainian military since the war, he ordered signals coming from the satellites over Crimea to be shut down. Musk told the author of this new book, Walter Isaacson, a neoliberal hack. Musk told Walter Isaacson, a neoliberal hack. Did I mention that Walter Isaacson is a neoliberal hack? Musk told the author, neoliberal hack Walter Isaacson, that he feared the attack on Russian ships would instigate a nuclear war. But let's be honest, secretly, Musk is rooting for Putin. Supreme Court Justice Brett Kavanaugh, appearing at a judicial conference in Ohio, told an audience of judges and lawyers that the Supreme Court is about to announce new steps to guarantee the American people have more faith in the institution, in the Supreme Court. Well, here's a way to guarantee that I have more faith in the Supreme Court. How about you step down? How about you just retire, Brett Kavanaugh? I know that would restore my faith in the Supreme Court. Kavanaugh said the court is very much aware that the public is concerned about the ethics involved in the justices' financial disclosures, as many are now calling for more transparency. You know, I'm concerned about uh, rape in your case, Brett Kavanaugh. I'm not so concerned about the transparency uh, when it comes to your financials. Uh, I'm more concerned about the rapes that the FBI ignored during your confirmation hearings. As it, stands, as it stands now when it comes to financial disclosures, for the most part, uh, when it comes to disclosing gifts from billionaires, the justices are on the your honor system. But the your honor system doesn't work since uh, way too many of these Republican justices are not honorable. Here is what the rapist, Brett Kavanaugh, told the Conference of Lawyers and Judges. We are continuing to work on the issues, and I'm hopeful there will be some concrete steps taken soon on that. Why don't you step into some wet concrete and then jump into a river? Uh, that's what uh, the rapist, Brett Kavanaugh, told the audience of judges and lawyers on Thursday. That would be Brett Kavanaugh, rapist. A documentary entitled Justice, uh, which premiered at the Sundance Festival in January, reveals that more witnesses of Brett Kavanaugh's sexual impropriety step forward, but were ignored by the FBI, as well as the Republican-controlled Senate Judiciary Committee back in 2018. The director, Doug Lyman, filed a Freedom of Information request and that revealed there was, sit down for this, 4,500 people contacted the tip line set up by the FBI. 4,500 people contacted the FBI and said they had proof that Brett Kavanaugh was sexually inappropriate or was inappropriate with them, and all 4,500 of those tips went uninvestigated by the FBI, so he gets to sit on the Supreme Court. You know, it sounds like Danny Masterson picked the wrong cult. 
If Danny Masterson wanted to get away with raping women, forget Scientology. He should have become a Republican. I think that's a safer cult for rapists. Well, many of the ethics questions raised when it comes to financials, many of these questions stem from Clarence Thomas failing to disclose the hundreds of thousands of dollars in gifts he's accepted from far-right extremist billionaires like Harlan Crow, who owns one of the largest collections of Hitler memorabilia in the world. Yes, that means Harlan Crow is a Republican. Harlan Crow has one of the largest collections of Hitler memorabilia in the world. So it's not just the money that's the problem with uh, Clarence Thomas or Alito, Samuel Alito, not disclosing these, you know, $100,000 vacations that they're treated to. Uh, Clarence also has a, uh, a wife named Ginny, Ginny Thomas. She's an unhinged far-right extremist who helped organize the Stop the Steal rally on January 6th. While she didn't go inside the Capitol, she was in the crowd that day. And according to the January 6th committee, she sent hundreds of texts to Donald Trump's White House chief of staff after the 2020 presidential election. That would be Mark Meadows. Ginny Thomas, the wife of Clarence Thomas, sent hundreds of memos to um, Mark, memos to Mark Meadows insisting that Biden stole the election and that Trump must fight to stay in office because, quote, this is a battle between good and evil. This is a battle between good and evil. In one memo, Ginny Thomas, that would be the unhinged wife of Clarence Thomas, the unhinged justice on the Supreme Court, in one memo, Ginny Thomas sang the praises of Sidney Powell, who, by the way, Donald Trump called crazy. That's according to Hope Hicks. Hope Hicks's testimony was Donald Trump put Sidney Powell's phone call. He, he muted his voice and said, she's crazy. But he still took her advice when it came to voter and election fraud, claiming election fraud. Uh, uh, in, in her memos, Ginny Thomas uh, sang the praises of Sidney Powell, said, don't fire her, keep the faith. That's what she wrote, keep the faith, because this is a battle between good and evil. So keep the faith, don't fire Sidney Powell. And then Ginny Thomas, in one of her memos, recommended that Mark Meadows hire as part of this election fraud team that he hire uh, a regular who appears on Alex Jones's Infowars. And uh, among the many things that this regular claims is that the shooting at the Sandy Hook Elementary School was a false flag operation. According to these memos that were handed over to the January 6th committee, Ginny Thomas is on a lot of QAnon sites, and she was forwarding links to Mark Meadows from QAnon links as though it was legitimate. Ginny Thomas has also received hundreds of thousands of dollars in salary from wealthy benefactors of Clarence Thomas, who also pay her to sit on the boards of various super PACs. And interestingly enough, because we're going to be talking about executive privilege and congressional oversight, Clarence Thomas was the only Supreme Court justice to vote against a ruling that ordered Donald Trump to turn over White House documents to the January 6th committee, right? The January 6th committee wanted all the documents related to January 6th. Donald Trump claimed executive privilege. I'll talk about what that is later. And it was taken to the Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court said, no, these documents regarding January 6th are not protected by executive privilege. This is not a separations of power issue. And so you have to hand over all these documents that the January 6th committee wants from the White House. Every single Supreme Court justice said 
turn over these documents to the January 6th committee, except for one. And who do you think that justice was? That's right, Clarence Thomas. Clarence Thomas is the only justice who said, no, Donald Trump doesn't have to turn over the January 6th documents to the January 6th committee because Clarence Thomas didn't want anyone seeing the texts that his unhinged wife, Ginny, was sending not just to Mark Meadows, the White House chief of staff, but to John Eastman as well. John Eastman is now one of 18 co-defendants in that Georgia RICO trial, and he's best friends with Jenny Thomas, having met her when he clerked for her unhinged husband, Clarence Thomas. Now, I don't know if I've ever mentioned this before, but Jenny Thomas failed the bar exam in Nebraska. She was born in Nebraska. She went to law school, and... uh, she failed the bar exam in Nebraska. I'm going to assume it can't be that hard. It's Nebraska. Just name the three branches of government. You know, hey, it's a red state. I don't care what people in Nebraska think. Uh, anyway, Ginny Thomas couldn't uh, pass the bar. Uh, but John Eastman did. He passed the bar in California, but he might end up losing his license to practice law in the state of California as his disbarment trial continues. He's a very busy man, John Eastman, from the Claremont Institute in California. Uh, He took the stand on Wednesday for six hours and testified on his behalf and made the case for why he should be allowed to keep his law license. They're stripping, they want to strip him of his law license specifically for the role he played on January 6th. So this was like a a precursor of what we can expect in the RICO trial down in Georgia, right? Throughout most of his testimony on Wednesday before the bar, Eastman alternated between pleading the fifth and invoking attorney-client privilege when he was asked questions about Donald Trump and January 6. So that establishes that, yes, in fact, Donald Trump had hired John Eastman. The fact that Eastman invoked attorney-client privilege is proof that he was working with Donald Trump. That's a problem for Trump. Well, one of the questions during the disbarment proceedings on Wednesday, uh, one of the questions, one of the many questions that John Eastman refused to answer was whether or not Republicans were planning to replace Vice President Pence on January 6th with Iowa Republican Senator Chuck Grassley, who, because he was the longest serving member of the Senate, held the title of Senate President Pro Tem, which means, if necessary, he can replace the Senate president, who, according to the Constitution, is also the vice president. I I know that's confusing. Mike Pence was vice president, but he was also the president of the Senate. That's a constitutional role. He's the the vice president, is also the president of the Senate, which means he occasionally gets to perform ceremonial duties like counting the electoral votes on January 6th. Now, it has been suggested that after it became apparent to John Eastman and Kenneth Cheesebro and Sidney Powell and Rudy Giuliani and Mark Meadows and Donald Trump after it became apparent that Mike Pence was not going to obey Donald Trump, right? When Mike Pence said, I'm going to certify the election, it has been suggested that people in the White House, possibly John Eastman, reached out to Republicans in the Senate to make Chuck Grassley, Senator Chuck Grassley, count the Electoral College votes on January 6th instead of Mike Pence. 
a move that, according to the Constitution, would be perfectly legal. And it's been done before, apparently. Uh, in the past, the, the vice president, the president of the Senate, was not available on January 6th to count the Electoral College. And they had the, uh, the uh, Senate president pro tem uh, fill in for the vice president, who was also president of the Senate. Uh, so Eastman's memos, John Eastman's memos, included a backup plan to replace Mike Pence with the elderly Chuck Grassley if Pence refused to cooperate. Now, Chuck Grassley is pushing 90. He denies that he ever took the offer seriously, but he is a Republican. And he was quoted on January 5th, Roll, Roll Call, the newspaper, the magazine, the website that covers Congress, quoted Republican octogenarian Chuck Grassley saying the following about January 6th, quote, if the vice president isn't there and we don't expect him to be there, I will be presiding over the Senate. Grassley later, after January 6th, said, well, I wasn't referring to that part of January 6th. I was referring to another session the Senate was going to be holding on January 6th, not the counting of the votes on January 6th. So it has been suggested, and Eastman refused to answer, it has been suggested that Chuck Grassley was willing to play ball with Eastman, Cheesebro, Sidney Powell, Peter Navarro, who I'll be talking about shortly, Donald Trump, that perhaps Chuck Grassley might have done what Mike Pence wasn't willing to do, but something happened and he backed out. Well, back in... August, a federal grand jury indicted Donald Trump for election interference. And that same grand jury was given a month off, but now they've reconvened. They're back to work and have begun taking testimony from witnesses who might help special counsel Jack Smith serve up his next round of indictments. There are more indictments coming Trump's way. Now, according to the latest reports, Jack Smith, he's the special counsel, he is looking into how Donald Trump and Sidney Powell, the lawyer Sidney Powell, who he called crazy, how they both raised money separately, but they both raised money immediately after the 2020 presidential election, claiming they needed that money to investigate voter fraud. There are now reports that this grand jury that has reconvened, there are reports that this grand jury will hear more testimony from more witnesses who can shed light on the hundreds upon hundreds of millions of dollars Donald Trump's Save America PAC raised right after the 2020 election. Uh, he re between uh, like... Uh, November 3rd and January 6th, I think it's estimated his Save America PAC raised $150 million, and nobody can tell Jack Smith where it went. Russian mob. He stole from the mob, right? Uh, so, but Trump said, and this is wire fraud, give me your money, and this way I can pay people to investigate election fraud. Rudy didn't get paid a cent. Jenna, Al nobody got paid. And uh, prosecutors want to know where all that money went. I'm guessing Jack Smith is going to indict Donald Trump and possibly Sidney Powell on wire fraud. Uh, they are also reportedly looking into Sidney Powell's nonprofit called the Defending the Republic Fund which also raised millions after the election. It gets really interesting. Now, I reported last month that in 2022, 
before Jack Smith became the special counsel, Justice Department lawyers who were prosecuting the Oath Keepers for the role they played in the January 6th attack on our Capitol, they wanted to investigate reports that Sidney Powell's defending the Republic nonprofit was secretly paying the legal fees for the founder of the Oath Keepers, Stuart Rhodes, who was later convicted of seditious conspiracy and sentenced to 18 years in prison. I mean, this is really important when you start drawing a connection between Sidney Powell, who Donald Trump was just about to appoint special counsel inside the Justice Department so she could prosecute Democrats for election fraud, right? And she's paying the legal fees for Stuart Rhodes, who's now doing time for seditious conspiracy. I mean, this is the confluence of legal chicanery and violence. So it's, there's a direct line between, and I've pointed this out, Stanley Woodward and the Oath Keepers. And now it looks like, I hope, the special counsel with the grand jury, they're, they're looking into Sidney Powell's defending the Republic nonprofit that raised millions after the 2020 election, I'm going to assume they're going to try to find out if any of that money from Sidney Powell made it into the hands of Stuart Rhodes, the Yale Law School graduate, Stuart Rhodes, founder of the Oath Keepers, the very violent Stuart Rhodes, who is doing, what, 18 years for seditious conspiracy. Follow the legal fees. Follow the legal fees. This entire investigation, all these indictments, it's an indictment of our legal profession. Follow the legal fees. Who paid Stuart Rhodes' legal fees? Stuart Rhodes, Yale Law School. On Tuesday, special counsel Jack Smith quietly said, this was underreported uh, because Trump's lawyers wanted it kept secret, so this was underreported. But on Tuesday, we found out that special counsel Jack Smith said that he's had it with Donald Trump taking to social media and giving interviews on Newsmax, trashing prosecutors like him, and the judge in this election interference trial that's been scheduled to start in March of next year. In a motion that was partly secret, special counsel Jack Smith told the judge that uh, he is worried that Donald Trump is purposely making public statements to contaminate the jury pool. Which means, you know, it, they do lock up people before trial. I don't know if you heard that. Uh, you're, you're free on bond, but there are terms uh, for your bail. And if you violate those terms, you could be put in jail uh, pending trial. That's what Fulton County Jail basically is. Uh, well, down in Georgia on Thursday, Trump's lawyers filed a motion with the judge in Phony Willis's racketeering trial they filed a motion that uh, they are considering, considering filing a motion with the federal, federal court to request that the trial be moved into a federal courtroom. OK, so uh, just so we're clear here, they filed a motion informing the judge that they're considering filing a motion with a federal court in uh, Atlanta to request that this trial be moved into a federal courtroom. Uh, several of the 19 co-defendants, in, including uh, Trump's former White House Chief of Staff Mark Meadows, have uh, made the similar request to get bumped up into a federal courtroom. Trump and his lawyers uh, filed a motion saying that they're planning they might file a motion to get it bumped into a federal bumped up into a federal 
uh, courtroom. This request was made to hit certain deadlines so that Trump can make the request in full when his lawyers have more time to prepare. They're deluged, obviously. Trump is expected to ask that this racketeering trial be moved into a federal courtroom for many reasons, one being that a federal courtroom in Atlanta would draw from a more favorable pro-Trump jury pool as opposed to Fawny Willis's Fulton County, which is Biden country. So it's going to be hard to find uh, jurors who voted for Trump in Fulton County. If the trial does get bumped up to a federal courtroom, the Fulton County District Attorney, Fawny Willis, would still prosecute. But out. That was the message that Fawny Willis sent to Chairman of the House Judiciary Committee, Jim Jordan, who wrote her a letter last week demanding to know if her office relies on federal funding, funding that he warned would be removed if he can prove it was being used to persecute Donald Trump. Madam D.A. sent a letter to Jim Jordan on Thursday warning him to butt out. She suggested that he is interfering in a criminal trial and that the Constitution clearly states he lacks the jurisdiction to monitor local criminal trials. Madam D.A. concluded her letter to Jim Jordan by saying that if Jim Jordan is so concerned about what's going on in Fulton County, he should launch an investigation into the racist threats made against the lives of her employees inside the Fulton County District Attorney's office. She wrote to Jim Jordan, for your information, I am attaching 10 examples of threats this office has received. I am providing these examples to give you a window into what has happened to my staff and me as I keep the promise of my oath to the United States and Georgia constitutions, and I will not allow myself to be bullied or threatened by members of Congress, local elected officials, or others who believe Lady Justice should not be blind, and that America has different laws for different citizens, unquote. Madam D.A., I should mention, passed the bar, just like her Black Panther father, who, uh, after sympathizing with the Black Panthers, the same way Clarence Thomas did, uh, he passed the bar and practiced law in California, And so uh, Madam D.A. and her Black Panther father, both of them are allowed to practice law because they could pass the bar. Uh, Unlike, and I don't know if I ever mentioned this before, but uh, did I ever mention that uh, Fonnie Willis and her Black Panther father passed the bar, but Jim Jordan did not? Did I ever mention that on this show, that Jim Jordan, the... Republican chairman of the House Judiciary Committee, when he wasn't busy looking the other way as the men on his wrestling team were being sexually assaulted, he also attended law school. He opines all the time on judiciary appointments and is responsible for Republican messaging when it comes to all things legal because he went to law school, but he did not pass the bar. Jim Jordan, the did I, did I ever mention this? I don't know if I've ever mentioned this. There's so much to go over, and I've been meaning to tell everybody that Jim Jordan, the Republican chairman of the House Judiciary Committee, was too stupid to pass the bar exam. He went to law school, but he, he couldn't pass the bar. But Fawny Willis and her Black Panther father, they both passed the bar, and they could practice law. Jim Jordan can't practice law, but Fawny Willis and her Black Panther father can. There's a little race science to consider, my Republican friends. I know you're into race science. The Black Panther and his daughter pass the bar, 
But Jim Jordan, the cracker from Ohio, failed it. Some race science to consider while you're studying phrenology at uh, the home school. Well, speaking of dumb white people, before becoming the dumb white governor of Arkansas, stupid and white Sarah Huckabee was White House spokesperson for Donald Trump. And she's a devout Christian. She's a Christian first. That's what she says. And uh, this is, I bring up uh, uh, Sarah Huckabee because it, it shows you the kind of work that Madam D.A., Fonnie Willis, she has her work cut out for her because there are some devout Christians like Ginny Thomas. Did I mention that Ginny Thomas, the unhinged wife of Clarence Thomas, failed the bar? She couldn't pass the bar. Did I ever mention that? Uh, there are these crazy, unhinged, devout Christians like Ginny Thomas and Sarah Huckabee Sanders. Uh, well, Ginny Thomas failed the bar. Sarah Huckabee Sanders passed the salad bar and went straight for the dessert station. I don't care. I really don't. Complain to me. I don't care. These are horrible people. Uh, uh, all right, I'm apologizing. I shouldn't have said Sarah Huckabee passed the salad bar and went straight for the dessert station. I apologize. I, that was wrong. But Sarah Huckabee, like Ginny Thomas, thinks the 2020 election was a battle between good and evil. That's what religion, that's why religion is so valuable. That's why our founding fathers said, bring it on in. Let's, let's, come on, no wall between church and state. Just let's have devout people bring in the battle between good and evil when we're trying to solve uh, political issues. Here is the incredibly stupid an evil governor of Arkansas, Sarah Huckabee, whose brother, uh, we believe, killed a dog. We'll talk about that uh, some other time. Here is the incredibly dumb and stupid and evil Arkansas governor, Sarah Huckabee. Here she is uh, being interviewed by a far right-wing Christian news network when she was still in the White House lying for Donald Trump. Here she is braying about Donald Trump. I think God uh, calls all of us to uh, fill different roles at different times. And I think that um, he wanted Donald Trump to become president, and that's why he's there. And uh, I think he has done a tremendous job in supporting a lot of the things that uh, people of faith really care about. Yeah. And uh, Donald Trump, would you like to respond to that, please? Stormy Horseface Daniels. Ah, thank you. Interesting. Mike Huckabee used to be the governor of Arkansas, and uh, he's still the father of Sarah Huckabee. And before he was governor of Arkansas, he was an evangelical minister, and he too sees this as a battle between good and evil. Here was a warning coming from Mike Huckabee, he issued this warning earlier this week, and it's almost as though Jesus is speaking through Mike Huckabee. Here's the problem. If these tactics end up working to keep Trump from winning or even running in 2024, it is going to be the last American election that will be decided by ballots rather than bullets. Ah, so people are going to be... They're going to stop voting, and your people are going to take out their guns in support of this great Christian, Donald Trump. President Trump, the chosen one, what do you say to the devoutly Christian Mike Huckabee? Stormy horseface Daniels. I see. Okay. Georgia State Senator Colton Moore, you're a huge defender of Donald Trump. And you're leading the efforts to impeach Fonnie Willis. What are your thoughts? Do you want a civil war? I don't want a civil war. I don't want to have to draw my rifle. 
Mm -hmm. How many times do you think the children trapped in this guy's basement have heard the, <laughs> those words? <laughs> How many kids bound and gagged in Colton Moore's basement have heard, I don't want to draw my rifle. Why are you making me draw my rifle? You going to keep crying? Want me to draw my rifle? Donald Trump, your thoughts uh, about Colton Moore. Stormy horseface Daniels. Yeah. I mean, do you see why? I, I see why he's the chosen one. I, I see why God wanted Donald Trump to, to be president. He's, he's, he's perfect. He's a perfect Christian. He's, he's everything Jesus would want. Well, on yesterday's show, we talked about six residents of Colorado who are suing the Democratic senator, uh, I'm sorry, the Democratic secretary of state for Colorado, urging her to strike Donald Trump's name from the state ballot in 2024. And that would be in accordance with Section 3 of the 14th Amendment, which forbids anyone who ever held elective office and then took part in or aided and abetted an insurrection. It's uh, the, the third section of the 14th Amendment, right? If you took part in an insurrection as an elected official, you're banned from... Uh, ever serving again. And great legal minds now want to know, uh, was it actually an insurrection? Was January 6th? Because, you know, that's subject to debate. And who better to turn to on subjects like this? Who better to consult than failed newscaster Carrie? They stole my election in 2022, and they're going to steal my election in 2024, Lake. When Carrie Lake is not down at Mar-a-Lago sucking up to Donald Trump, trying to be his vice president. She's running a not-so-secret whisper campaign against Marjorie Taylor Greene, who she fears Trump will pick as his unhinged vice president instead of her. There's a little whisper campaign uh, going back and forth. A lot of competition between Carrie Lake and and uh, Marjorie Taylor Greene. And Marjorie Taylor Greene is not sitting back and taking it. She's got her own whisper campaign against Carrie Lake. Marjorie Taylor Greene is spreading rumors about Carrie Lake. She's saying that Carrie Lake is not crazy. That's, that's pretty bad to say that about someone. Anyway, here is the brilliant Carrie Lake. Uh, was January 6th an insurrection? Because we're talking about the third section of the 14th Amendment. We may be able to strike Donald Trump's name from the ballot uh, because of the 14th Amendment, but we have to first establish whether or not January 6th was, in fact, an insurrection. What says you, Carrie Lake? Well, I think Americans are coming around to the fact that it wasn't an insurrection. Okay, it wasn't an insurrection. Then, then tell us, oh wise when what was it? It was a staged riot. A staged riot. Okay, I've heard people call it a riot and not an insurrection, but you're saying January 6th was staged by whom? And many of the people were encouraged to go in by FBI informants. Well, hang on. Okay, so you're saying... FBI informants staged January 6th, and it was the FBI that told people to storm the Capitol. That's interesting. That, that makes sense. So that means this guy would be an FBI informant. We're going to walk down. We're going to walk down. Anyone you want, but I think right here, we're going to walk down to the Capitol. Wow, it makes sense. Uh, Trump was an FBI informant. You know, two nights ago, I reported that Enrique Terrio, the leader of the Proud Boys, was also an FBI informer. So this guy, Donald Trump, was an FBI informer. Continue. And we're probably not going to be cheering so much for some of them. Because you'll never... Take back our country with weakness. You have to show strength and you have to be strong. 
Wow, he was an FBI informer. Well, you know, Rudy Giuliani, you also spoke on the ellipse on January 6. You called for trial by combat. Are you an FBI informer too? I like scotch. Okay, go on. I drink scotch. Okay, thank you for that. Yes, you do. Well, Thursday night was the big fundraiser at Bedminster Golf Course in New Jersey for Rudy Giuliani. It was hosted by Donald Trump, and he charged $100,000 a plate. You know, Rudy's broke, and he and Bernie Carrick, his former police commissioner, they've flown down to Mar-a-Lago at least three times saying you've raised hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars through the Save America PAC to investigate election fraud. They've only paid Rudy $350,000 for his expenses, which is basically his bar bill at the mark on a Sunday afternoon. So he wants his money, and Donald Trump will not part with the hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars that the Save America PAC raised. He's not giving any of it to Rudy, but to placate Rudy, he's last night, Thursday, he threw a big $100,000 a plate fundraiser uh, for Rudy at the Bedminster Country Club. Uh, they, they went with $100,000 a plate because 100 billion, gazillion, dillion, trillion, uh, didn't fit on the the ad that they didn't put anywhere for anyone to see. Uh, so we're doing this very early in the morning on Friday, and I don't know what the final tally is. Uh, $100,000 a plate. Uh, I don't know how much was raised. We'll get the tally later in the day. But to give you an idea of how much money was raised for Rudy's legal defenses, let's uh, pay a visit to Ivana Trump's grave at Bedminster Country Club. This is actual footage from the Daily Mail of Ivana Trump's grave at Bedminster Country Club, where last night's fundraiser for Rudy was held. And this should basically give you an idea of how much money was raised for Rudy Giuliani. Let's see. Trump essentially buries his first wife in a pauper's grave. The, the mother of his three idiot children. Look at that. She barely gets a headstone. But, you know, if someone was stupid enough to pony up $100,000 at the Bedminster Country Club, where Ivana Trump is barely buried. I, I think I can see her toes sticking up through the grass. Does anyone re really think Donald Trump is going to let Rudy keep any of that? No, no. But there's Rudy. Rudy. There's Rudy Sunday on the right. There he is at the Bedminster Country Club. This was the big rally that they... The, the big bikers for Trump rally at the Bedminster Golf Club on Sunday night. Motorcyclists from all over America drove to Bedminster, New Jersey, to show their support for Donald Trump. And there's Rudy. He's so excited, looking relevant. He's acting like that's a real iPhone, taking real pictures that he, that he can afford the, the, <laughs> the electricity to charge his phony cardboard iPhone. Uh, hundreds of bikers from all over America showed up to, to lend support to Donald Trump. And Trump was so grateful. He met them outside his door and thanked them for their support. And he said, thank you. And then he said, I wish I could let some of you inside. I know you want to use the toilet, but they're all out of order. But thanks for coming anyway. And then he shut the door because those are his people, bikers. This is... This is where it ends with Donald Trump. Bikers. He does not look good, Donald Trump. I mean, he never looked good, but he is beginning to age. I love this. I like to see Rudy Giuliani suffer, right? What, you know, what he did to the, just what he did to those two election workers in Fulton County. I don't 
I do care what happens to Rudy. I, I want to see him. Uh, well, here's his approval ratings. This is from the Washington Post. They, they tracked Rudy's uh, <laughs> approval rating starting with 2001 all the way to 2023. So here's when he peaked. That would be in 2001, right after the World Trade Center came down. Ah, yes, the golden age for Rudy, right? The World Trade Center came down. Rudy never had it better. Uh, look at it. It's like it tops like 75% approval rating. And 2023, it's down to 16%. It's uh, how far he's fallen uh, getting into bed with Donald Trump. Your thoughts on your approval rating, Mr. Mayor? I like scotch. Yes, you do. You like your scotch. So was it an insurrection? That's the big question, right? We're trying to determine, because if it was an insurrection and Donald Trump led it, well, that, you know, could get him scrubbed from the ballot, according to the 14th Amendment, right? Peter Navarro and Steve Bannon will try to convince you that they didn't want an insurrection. They're trying to convince us right now that they wanted to overthrow the government of the United States peacefully. They didn't want any violence. Uh, Peter Navarro worked inside the Trump White House as a trade advisor, and Steve Bannon, well, you all know who he is. And last year, the January 6th committee desperately wanted Steve Bannon and Peter Navarro to testify because the two of them dreamed up a peaceful, non-peaceful transfer of power where Biden didn't get to be president and it would look legitimate, right? They came up with, it's called the Green Bay Sweep. And we've talked about it a little and it's very germane to the conversation because Peter Navarro just was found guilty yesterday of contempt of Congress and it involves the Green Bay Sweep. So uh, this is how it worked, okay? Flood the zone. It's called the Green Bay Sweep because it was Vince Lombardi's favorite play. Vince Lombardi was the coach of the Green Bay Packers, and he called this play the Green Bay Sweep. Flood the zone. Get, get the other team so confused they have no idea where the ball is. Get 100 Republicans in the House of Representatives on January 6th and a few in the Senate, like Ted Cruz, right? Get them to challenge the electors on January 6th, especially the electors from the battleground states, okay? Each challenge on January 6th, each state challenge would take two hours because it would start in the Senate, but then it would have to go back to the House of Representatives. And that would take about two hours to fl flush it out, flesh it out, vote on it, then come back into the Senate. The idea was to flood, flood the zone with parliamentary chicanery so that January 6th would last for days and chaos would be whipped up on the streets. This is from Kenneth Cheesebro's memos talking about whipping up chaos on the streets so that the Supreme Court would be forced to intervene the same way they did in the 2000 presidential election and awarded it to Bush, right? We all know that this heavily conservative court would have sent the election back to Congress. This was part of the Green Bay sweep. The, the, they would have dragged out January 6th. The Supreme Court would then intervene because, you know, for continuity's sake, for stability, and they would say, have Congress decide who the president is. And as I've, uh, as I've explained, because of the way votes from each state are weighted in such an instance, Trump would win because each state gets one vote and it, they count up your delegates. Do you have Republican delegates? How many Republican delegates do you have? How many Democratic delegates do you have? And so California 
would get one vote, but because it's a heavily blue state, it would be for Biden. And Nebraska, their delegation to Congress is Republican. It's a red state. They get one vote. They don't deserve one vote. And that would go for Trump. There are more red states than there are blue states, right? More people, bl the blue states have a larger population. Tens of millions more people live in blue states than in red states. But because it's the way it's spread out here in America, there are more red states than blue states. And in this scenario, the Green Bay sweep scenario, Trump wins because... There are more red states than blue states, and they each get one vote, okay? Uh, that was the Green Bay sweep, and it might have worked, but then Trump went ahead and told everyone to storm the Capitol. He is impulsive. You know, he didn't have faith in the Green Bay sweep, because I do think the Green Bay sweep might have worked. Had he, had, he, had he and Rudy not told everybody to storm the Capitol— and, and had they given the Green Bay sweep the, the time, uh, they could have dragged it out. And Trump could have, uh, Trump still could be president, but he's impulsive. So the January 6th committee desperately wanted to hear from Peter Navarro, who was convicted on Thursday, and Steve Bannon, because this really was the game. This was the game. Uh, the insurrection was checkers, but the Green Bay sweep, that was chess. This was, this was the game. This was the game Cheesebro and Eastman were playing. This excited them. The insurrection was, you know, that was also the plan, but the, the, the great legal minds were not interested in that. Uh, so Peter Navarro, who was convicted yesterday, and Steve Bannon, who was convicted last year for the same, on the same contempt of Congress charge, uh, the, they were enamored by the Green Bay sweep, which was to grind the wheels of the Electoral College to a halt. And it would have seemed, if you read the memos, it would have seemed on the up and up. It involved the phony electors, so it wasn't on the up and up. It involved lying about election fraud. But, you know, you go to the Supreme Court, the Supreme Court is worried about the, the fighting in the streets, the, cha the chaos, and they're going to let Congress decide. And if Congress decides, uh, it looks legitimate. Uh, so there was no way Steve Bannon or Peter Navarro were going to testify before the January 6th committee. Because this is some dangerous stuff, right? Violence is one thing, right? The Oath Keepers and the Proud Boys and the meetings at the Willard Hotel. And this is low-level thugs who, you know, are dangerous. But this stuff really indicts the legal profession and the, and the Republican Party because Ted Cruz was in on it and Paul Gosar. If you remember... At 1 p.m., they were implementing the Green Bay sweep. Ted Cruz was challenging the results from Arizona with Paul Gosar, the, the unhinged dentist turned congressman from Arizona, right? So they were working together. The Senate and the House were working together. It was part of the Green Bay sweep, and it was being implemented. Ted Cruz was all in on it. This is dangerous stuff. This is really embarrassing because they probably did have about 100 Republican congressmen. I mean, you look, how, how many Republican congressmen after January 6th, how many Republican senators after January 6th, when they reconvened after the violence, still voted against certifying the election for Joe Biden? This is the really dangerous story about January 6th that there were a lot of Republicans who were in on the Green Bay sweep. And there was no way Peter Navarro or Steve Bannon were going to testify uh, before the January 6th committee because it's really dangerous. Uh, so they claimed, 
executive privilege. Now, you hear that all the time. This is a conceit that goes all the way back to George Washington. It's separations of power. The, the, pre, the executive branch uh, is supposed to be free from the legislative branch, and you can't have the legislative branch constantly sticking its nose into the business of the president, and the president can't stick his nose into the business of the legislative branch. You know, it's Article One versus Article Two. That's what they say. Uh, Article One of the Constitution is Congress. Article Two is the president. And there's a tension between the two, and it's always solved through Article Three of the Constitution, the Supreme Court. They never know, whenever issues of executive privilege come up, there are constantly congressional committees asking for information from the president, and sometimes the president will say, fine, take it. Other times he'll invoke executive privilege, and then Congress will decide, do we really want to challenge this? And January 6th committee said, yes, we really do want to challenge this. So they went to Article 3, the Supreme Court, and then the Supreme Court gets to decide, is this executive privilege or not? Okay? So... Uh, these, these, it's always adjudicated by the Supreme Court. You'll always hear, you're always going to hear about congressional oversight, and it's not set in stone. This has been going on for more than two centuries. They're, they're not certain, nor are they supposed to be, as to what constitutes executive privilege, what a congressional oversight committee is entitled to see from the White House and what they're not, and they always depend on the Supreme Court to decide. So Steve Bannon and Peter Navarro said executive privilege. Donald Trump didn't say it. They invoked executive privilege for Donald Trump. Uh, And uh, so uh, the uh, January 6th committee took it took it to the Supreme Court, right? Donald Trump said, I don't want to turn over my documents regarding January 6th. So they took it to the Supreme Court. And as I said earlier, every justice said, no, this isn't executive privilege. Turn over all the documents involving January 6th. You can't invoke executive privilege on this one. And as I pointed out earlier, every justice except one said uh, this doesn't involve executive privilege. Every justice except Clarence Thomas, because contained within those documents were emails and text messages from his unhinged wife, Jenny, who was forwarding QAnon links to White House Chief of Staff Mark Meadows. The woman is unhinged. That's why Clarence Thomas said, no, no, this is executive privilege. We don't want to turn these documents over to the January 6th committee. It's exe- My wife is crazy. That's executive privilege. Uh, that's basically the truth. But uh, that's the reason we did get to see Ginny Thomas's texts and emails is because Clarence Thomas was outnumbered. So... The January 6th committee really wanted to speak to Peter Navarro and Steve Bannon about the Green Bay sweep, and Navarro and Bannon ignored the subpoenas, and they not only ignored the subpoenas from the January 6th committee, they refused to produce documents that proved it was executive privilege. They just completely ignored uh, the, the January 6th committee. It was referred to the Justice Department, And then Bannon and Navarro were charged with contempt of Congress. That's the way it works, by the way. Congress says, wait a second, you're defying our subpoena. They refer it to the Justice Department. And the Justice Department says, well, we'll prosecute Steve Bannon and Peter Navarro, but we won't prosecute Mark Meadows uh, for contempt of Congress. Mark Meadows also refused to uh, cooperate with the January 6th committee. But he had a more legitimate claim of executive privilege. I mean, he was Donald Trump's White House chief of staff. He, if you're the chief of staff, you basically are the president. So he had a more legitimate 
claim of executive privilege. So the Justice Department, Merrick Garland's Justice Department said, we're not going to prosecute Mark Meadows for contempt of Congress, but we're going to we're going to prosecute Steve Bannon and uh, Peter Navarro. That's how it works. That's how it works. It's the Justice Department that decides whether or not to prosecute someone for contempt of Congress, which I think is a separations of power issue because the Justice Department is in the executive branch and answers to the president. So why does the executive branch get to determine what constitutes contempt of Congress and what doesn't? One of the many flaws in our system. So I hope that was clear because I know a lot of people ask me to explain it to them. And uh, it's confusing, especially to our foreign listeners. And by foreign listeners, I mean anyone who uh, is in America. I think foreigners understand this better than we do. Bannon, convicted last year of contempt of Congress, he's appealing that decision. And Navarro, Peter Navarro, this is, I'm saving the best for last. This makes me so happy. I like to see unhinged. I'm using the word unhinged a lot. I like to see Peter Navarro suffer. He had his trial on Thursday, and it didn't last long, right? The jury came back with a, uh, a decision. But first, let, I'm going to play a clip of Peter Navarro on Steve Bannon's podcast back in 2021. He was promoting his book. Peter Navarro wrote a book about the Green Bay sweep where he spilled everything. He just didn't want to go before a congressional committee. It's like John Bolton, right? I, I won't testify about the perfect phone call, Ukraine, because uh, I've got a book to promote. Peter Navarro was more than happy to discuss, explain the Green Bay sweep uh, in 2021. He, here he is on Steve Bannon's podcast, and he explains the Green Bay sweep much better than I can. January 6th, this whole notion that the little Jamie Raskins got that somehow President Trump wanted to do an insurrection. You are the hero on January 6th, Steve. As I say in Chapter 21 of In Trump Time, you were the guy who had the Green Bay Packers sweep strategy to go up to Capitol Hill. Pence is the quarterback. That we had 100 people working on the Green Bay team as linemen, halfbacks, and fullbacks, pulling guards who were going to make sure that we remanded the results back to the battleground states for a couple of weeks so we could get to the bottom of that. So we could get to the bottom of what? Election fraud? There, but that was the Green Bay sweep. So we could get to the bottom of that. The idea was to incite violence in the streets. Supreme Court steps in. Congress takes over and they elect Trump. Peter Navarro, he's in his 70s. He's almost as angry and almost as self-destructive as Steve Bannon. The two of them, uh, it's hard to tell who who's more uh, unhinged. So Eastman, uh, so, uh, Peter Navarro, his trial was this week and the jury uh, heard the trial. It all took place in one day. It was easy peasy, quick and easy. Uh, and so, and Navarro wouldn't sit still. He was pacing six, it was a six hour hearing the day before, before the trial started. And Navarro was twitching and pacing and he's a very angry man. And so I relate to him. I, I do. I, 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 if, if, you know, a couple of wrong turns in my life and I could see myself being Peter Navarro, uh, just willing <laughs> to destroy my life in order to destroy everybody else's. So the, the, uh, they have the trial, the jury goes to meet, and Peter Navarro immediately takes to, to Twitter. Jury in deliberations now, we're in God's hands now. The only thing certain are more legal bills. The only thing certain are more legal be bills. That's the Democrats' lawfare game. We'll have more once verdict is in. In the meantime, 
You can help me fight these weaponized partisan bastards at defendpeter.com, right? He's been complaining about the legal fees uh, all week. Eastman estimates this trial will cost him at least a million dollars. And he's asking, you know, Trump isn't helping him. Although Stanley Woodward is his attorney and Stanley Woodward is on retainer with Trump. But apparently Trump isn't paying enough of the legal fees. And the results were in after that tweet. Peter Navarro found guilty of uh, contempt of Congress, just like Steve Bannon, right? And now we're going to wait for the sentencing. Uh, We do know that Bannon, same crime, convicted of uh, contempt of Congress. Uh, Steve Bannon was sentenced to four months in prison. He's appealing that. And Navarro will be sentenced on January 12th, 2024. But his $1 million legal team, a million dollars for this, Uh, His $1 million uh, legal team, headed by Stanley Woodward, said this isn't over by a long shot, because that's what a million dollars gets you, right? Anybody who's ever been through a divorce uh, appeals and appeals, we're going to fight for you. Here, pay this bill. We're going to need a retainer again. You got your your retainers running low. We're going to fight for you. We're going to demand justice for you. They get the client all revved up and the next thing they squ- they've squeezed the schmuck Peter Navarro out of a million dollars. It's to, he wants justice. A good lawyer says, you know what? Honor the subpoena. Plead the fifth. Just plead the fifth. These lawyers, they got to earn their pay. We're going to take this all the way <laughs> to... <laughs> We're going to take this all the way to the Riviera next year when we cash your checks. I mean, we're going to take this to the Supreme Court. <laughs> Peter, this is, an, you know, this is a schmuck. This is, I could hear my father's voice. This is what a schmuck is, right? Uh, so this is what a million dollars gets you. Appeals and appeals, because if you're stupid enough, arrogant enough, angry enough, to fight a subpoena in court, there's always going to be a lawyer in Washington willing to cash your checks and say anything, and say anything is what Peter Navarro's lawyers did. See, Navarro is a professor, and he's twitchy, bad divorce, can't sit still, and he's, you know, starved, like me, for attention. He, He And he wanted his day in court. And he was willing to pay a million dollars that he didn't have. He was willing to pay a million dollars for his day in court. All he had to do was testify and plead the fifth. But this is my moment, right? I'm a fighter and I'm going to stay relevant. I'm in my 70s, but I'm still relevant. And I'm going to make my stand against the Marxist woke mob. And what he was really looking forward to and this is the God's honest truth. I'm going to show you this. He was looking forward to his moment, his moment, that press conference in front of the bank of microphones outside the courtroom after the verdict. He was going to play the martyr. He had it all planned. And he paid a million dollars for this moment. But first, one of his lawyers, his legal team, it wasn't just Stanley Woodward, One of his lawyers wanted to say something first, right? Peter Navarro has been waiting for this moment all year. But, you know, someone on his legal team wanted to say something. And in a rare act of humility, Peter Navarro was willing to share the spotlight with this uh, lawyer. This is what he paid $1 million for, all right? This is the big defiant We're taking this to the Supreme Court moment, right? I don't care what it costs me. But first, here's one of my lawyers who so far has cost me a million dollars. Here's his lawyer who's really concerned for Peter Navarro. This is right after Peter Navarro lost. Look at the the grim visage on this lawyer. And he has something he wants to say. 
I don't, I don't have anything much more to add to what Mr. Rally just said. Yeah, I just today was a, an important step uh, in the direction uh, of a successful appeal. And that's uh, about all I have to say. <laughs> you seem to have missed the joke there. <laughs> I'm going to play that again. This is the, the lawyer, million dollars, million dollar legal team. And the lawyer is having a great time, right? Cash the check. And he, he makes his joke. And then somebody screams, you lost. And then he, and then he says, uh, you didn't get the joke. <laughs> they watch it again. I just love this. Million dollars. Oh, I, don't, I don't have anything much more to add to what Mr. Rally just yes, said. Uh, yeah, I just today was a, an important step uh, in the direction uh, of a successful appeal. And uh, that's about all I have to say. <laughs> you seem to have missed the joke there. <laughs> you seem to have missed the joke there. Aww. And But Peter Navarro got the joke, right, Peter? You... Uh, you, you, you thought it was funny, right? Funny joke. You didn't miss it. <laughs> Million dollars. Million dollars. He's, it's beginning to dawn on him that the lawyer doesn't give a shit. He's just cashing checks, making jokes. You're going to... Have to pay another million dollars so you don't end up in prison. All right. Very funny. Very funny. Well, meanwhile, there was a whole legal team here. Not just this, not the funny guy. There was uh, Stanley Woodward who was upstairs uh, calling for a mistrial. This is true. But while this press conference was going on, uh, Stanley Woodward, Peter Navarro's attorney, was upstairs calling for a mistrial telling the judge that the jury had run into protesters during a lunch break and the protesters were able to influence the jury. The, the, uh, so what, what ha basically happened is uh, Peter Navarro was irate. The protesters all, all week were picking on Peter Navarro. He kept trying to give these press conferences for his moment in the sun and the, the protesters were pretty funny and they were heckling him and they were defiant and they made Peter Navarro so angry that after he lost, he said to Stanley Woodward, uh, claim there's a mistrial, claim there's a mistrial because of the protesters outside and because, you know, they're lawyers. Sure, but it's good. Couple more billable hours for a mistrial. You got it, pal. Whatever you want. They lawyers will just cash your checks. Yes. The protesters influence the jury. Yes. More billable hours for me. Uh, so it was a it was a standoff between Peter Navarro and the protesters. He was furious at the protesters because they wouldn't let him speak. He paid a million dollars for this moment in the sun to stand in front of a bank of microphones after he, he lost this big trial, the trial of the century, and he wanted to say, you know, I'm a martyr here and this isn't about me or Donald Trump. It's about the Constitution and separations of power and what kind of future we're leaving our children. I know what kind of future <laughs> Peter Navarro isn't leaving <laughs> his children. He just spent a million dollars and counting for his big day in court. You schmuck. All you had to do, you get the subpoena, you go and testify, you plead the fifth. But you, you wanted this moment, so you got your moment. So... Uh, here we go. Here is the big standoff between Peter Navarro and the protesters. Will Peter Navarro get his million dollar moment in the sun? <laughs> OK, no, he's going to share it first with another attorney. That's what's going to happen. Uh, his other attorney, because, you know, the attorneys have to speak up. This is John Rowley, the third which means there was a first and a second. John Rowley III, uh, he was going to say something. 
he wanted to say something to prove to Peter Navarro that he was worth every penny of those one million dollars. <laughs> Of those one million dollars. And by the way, if anyone else, this is, was his message. I'm going to show you that I was worth every penny of those one million dollars. And if anyone else is stupid enough to disobey a congressional subpoena, my name is John Rowley III, and I'll take your money. I'll cash your checks as well. Here is the great legal mind, John Rowley III, explaining why he was worth a million dollars, why this case was so important. There are legal issues here uh, that need to be decided by the Court of Appeals. Ah, there are legal issues here that need to be decided by the Court of Appeals. So we're going to appeal another million dollars, okay? There are legal issues here, right? This isn't about Peter Navarro. This is about the law and the Constitution and buying my mistress a condo in Georgetown. Please continue, John Rowley III. Uh, Judge Maida decided, based upon an evidentiary hearing last week, that there was inadequate evidence to show that President Trump had formally instructed uh, Dr. Navarro to invoke executive privilege. Okay, so Judge Maida said, and Stanley Woodward, the lead attorney, agreed that there wasn't uh, evidence... Uh, what was what's the key word that Donald Trump hadn't granted executive privilege? Formally. Oh, he hadn't granted executive privilege formally. So, yes, he hasn't granted formally. But if you could read Donald Trump's mind, then you would know that he granted uh, executive privilege. Uh, he granted de facto executive privilege to Peter Navarro. But, you you know, you got to be able to read Donald Trump's mind. In uh, the hearings before the trial started, during the evidentiary hearings, Stanley Woodward went before Judge Maida and said, yes, it would be easier if we had actual proof that Donald Trump invoked executive privilege and told my client, Peter Navarro, not to testify before the January 6th committee. But since there is no actual evidence that says Donald Trump invoked executive privilege, you have to assume that he would. <laughs> That's what the great legal mind Stanley Woodward said. And this is John Rowley III explaining, uh, furthering the, the case uh, on this legal issue that must be taken to a higher court so Peter Navarro can rack up more debt. Continue, please, John Rowley III. We think that... Uh, that uh, okay, pull it out of your ass. You can find it. Go ahead. No, oh, come on. Go ahead. The the evidence established that that, in fact, President Trump instructed Dr. Navarro to invoke executive privilege. We think the evidence is that Donald Trump uh, invoked executive privilege. We think that we don't have any proof. That's why we lost. There was no executive privilege. That's why we lost. But we still think. Donald Trump was thinking of executive privilege, which is why we're going to appeal this and make more money. Please continue. Formally. Yes. OK, you said that already. But in any event, we think that based upon the separation of powers between Congress and the executive, that uh, executive privilege is part and parcel of the office of the president of the United States and that no uh, express invocation of privilege was even necessary. Okay, so I'm going to play that again. This is what a million dollars gets you, right? This is what John Rowley III is saying. He's saying, in any event, even if there is no proof that Donald Trump invoked executive privilege, we think separations of power in the Constitution dictates that he doesn't have to, that the executive pri privilege is implicit which means Congress has zero oversight, that they cannot call anyone from the White House to testify before Congress. This is what a million-dollar lawyer 
John Rowley III, is saying in public, this is, what, this is how he's trying to get his next gig, right? He's using this as his moment to basically say there's no such thing as congressional oversight. Listen to this again. This is what a million dollars buys you. But in any event, we think that based upon the separation of powers between Congress and the executive, that uh, executive privilege is part and parcel of the office of the president of the United States and that no uh, express invocation of privilege was even necessary. No express invocation of executive privilege was necessary because it's always there, which means no congressional oversight, no need for a Supreme Court to rule on this. That's, that's the million dollar argument. That is John Rowley III, Peter Navarro's attorney, earning his salary, pulling stuff out of his ass, just filling time. <laughs> That's, we've all done that. We don't get paid a million dollars to do that. He's just pulling stuff out of his ass. Well, now Peter Navarro, he let the lawyer speak. He's a professor. He's Dr. Navarro, Dr. Navarro. And Dr. Navarro paid a million dollars for this moment to stand in front of a bank of microphones on live television. CNN was covering this live. And this is Peter Navarro's moment to go down in history. This is where he's making his stand in defense of executive privilege, his, his stand against congressional oversight, the right of all Americans to defy a congressional subpoena. This is his big moment, right? Here we go. Enjoy. Let the man talk. Are you, are you interested in hearing him? Man, go ahead, Peter. Go ahead and talk. I don't agree with some of your shit, but go ahead and talk, man. <laughs> Did you hear the gentleman behind him? Let me just play this again. Listen carefully. I don't agree with some of your shit, but go ahead and talk. <laughs> Excuse me. Ah. Oh. This makes me too messant. This is, I don't agree with most of your S. This was on CNN today. I saw this and I went, huh? Is this CNN? Here. Shut I don't agree with some of your shit, but go ahead and talk. <laughs> Million dollars for this. Continue, Peter Navarro. Go ahead and talk. No, I did it. No, I did it. Go ahead and talk, man. Go ahead. Go ahead and talk, man. Go ahead. Go ahead. Come on. Go ahead. Sad day for America. Not not because um, not because they were guilty verdicts, because I can't come out and have an honest, decent conversation with the people of America. Yeah. Sad day for America because I can't come out here and have my moment, my honest, uh, decent conversation with the people of America. I'm live on CNN. This is my moment to be a martyr. And uh, the protesters, they're treating me like a substitute teacher. Um, There's cameras here. The marshals just saw you. The marshals just saw you. You're in trouble. You're in trouble. You just assaulted me. That man just assaulted me. He stuck a flagpole in between my legs. Don't touch me. Don't touch me. Um. <laughs> There you go. You're All right. Now. They're calling protective services. I was just assaulted. Cool. Look, if you got a sign, no, I hold did it, it over there. Liar. So I can hold it anywhere I want. This yeah. is public property. It's sir. assault. I want to press charges. Let the man talk. Are you, are you interested in hearing him? Yeah. Go ahead, Peter. Go ahead and talk. You're on shadow property. I don't agree with some of your shit, but go ahead and talk. Go ahead and talk. No, I did it. No, I did it. Go ahead and talk, man. Go ahead. A million dollars. That's the expression on Peter Navarro's face, and he's announcing <laughs> why he's taking this to the Supreme Court as a martyr. And he's like, you go, I I'm all in. I got to do another. <laughs> it's going to cost me another million dollars. But I don't know. please continue. Let the man talk. Go ahead. Do you? They, okay. I'll, come on, man. They, come on. Come on. Let him. Let him. Let, come on, man. If, if, if it was you, you would want the same respect, brother. All right. The man's trying to defend his ass. The man is trying to save his ass. This is live. Oh, this is C-SPAN, but it was also on CNN now. Let's go back to CNN. Here we go. Let the man talk, okay? 
People of America, I want you to understand that this is the problem we have right here. This kind of um, divide in our country uh, between the, the woke Marxist left and everybody else here. And this is nuts. So what, what I want to try to do here is have an interesting discussion about what just happened. That's what you all want to know. You know what's happening to poor Peter Navarro? They're flooding the zone. They're flooding the zone. They're just heckling him and blowing whistles and they won't let him talk. It's like the Green Bay sweep. Nobody knows where the ball is. This is so unfair to Peter Navarro. They're pulling the Green Bay sweep. I can't keep track of what he's trying. Where's the ball? I don't know. Please continue, Peter Navarro. Right. This is the same guy. So, all right. Um, I think. I think. Uh, well, what was your question? <laughs> it's the Green Bay sweep. It's the Green Bay sweep reversed. This is the play that Vince Lombardi. This was the. This was the play that Vince Lombardi really loved. The the Green Bay sweep reverse. Uh, poor Peter Navarro. A million dollars. All he wanted to do was flood the zone, slow down January 6, slow down the certification of the election by confusing everybody, dragging things out, having people challenge each slate of electors. And uh, and then he got hoisted by his own petard, the Green Bay sweep. Very sad. Well, this is where it really got sad. It got even sadder, which made me happier. Uh, this is where he turned on the crowd and played the victim. See, he's a very angry man. He's in his 70s, and he will never admit he's wrong. He'll never see the irony of inventing the Green Bay sweep and then getting swapped. Uh, he's never wrong. He's aggrieved. Like all fragile white men, he's aggrieved. He's the victim in all this. He really believes that because that's the MAGA movement. They're never wrong. They've been wronged. Let's watch this fragile white man play the victim in all this. I helped the president create hundreds of thousands of manufacturing jobs during the pandemic. Every one of you here, every one of you here use masks, gloves, Thermometers. Many of you got vaccinated. Many of you. Many no. of you use things like remdesivir or monoclonal antibodies. I helped do that. I did. I was the one of the guys in the White House. I was one of the guys in the White House early on, February 2020, writing memos say, this is serious. We got to get off the dime. And what do I get for that? I get a House of Representatives controlled by Nancy Pelosi put, trying to put me in prison. Why? Because I'm a Trump guy. I'm just a Trump guy. I'm just an innocent Trump guy. Nobody thanks me for COVID. A million dead Americans. Nobody thanks me for COVID. This is what white, fragile men think. And there's no solution to this other than locking them up. I'm David Feldman reminding you to stay strong and protect the weak. If you enjoyed this as much as I did, if you enjoyed watching this fragile white man, this aggrieved fragile white man who wanted to steal a presidential election, if you enjoyed watching him suffer as much as I do, uh, not only suffer, but he's like, now he's in debt. He's in his 70s. And, you know, he just all he had to do was plead the fifth. But he was starved for attention. I'm going to have my day in court and make my big statement. And you got to make your big statement. And the statement is you're a schmuck. That's your big statement. You told the world you're a schmuck, Peter Navarro. That's what you are. As my father used to say to me, you're a schmuck. If they had a competition for world's biggest schmuck, you'd come in second. Why second and not first? Because you're a schmuck. That is the definition of a schmuck. 
Peter Navarro. Rot in hell, Peter Navarro, with your Green Bay sweep. Anyway, uh, if you enjoyed any of this as much as I did, uh, please share it with your friends and uh, please subscribe to my channel. Please like this video so I can remain in your feed. Thank you to the moderators in the chat room for keeping the conversation civil. And um, what else? Subscribe to my newsletter. And there was something else. I forgot what it was. I'm supposed to ask. Oh, comments. I read all your comments. The comments are, just keep getting better and better and funnier and funnier and smarter and smarter. There's a problem now with links, by the way. Uh, YouTube, it, it, because we're getting spammed with links, we're not accepting links anymore in the comments section. So if you want to refer an article to me, Put the link in anyway, and I'll, it won't be a hot link, but I'll copy and paste it. I trust uh, the listeners uh, not to spam me. So if you have something you want me to see, just put the link in anyway. I can copy and paste it into a browser. Thank you again. Remember to stay strong and protect the weak and enjoy the suffering of bad people. There are bad people in this world. Peter Navarro is a bad person, and he's suffering tonight. And that's a good thing. I believe in law and order. We have 2.5 million people behind bars. We have the wrong people behind bars. Peter Navarro is suffering today, and that's a good thing. I'll be back tomorrow at 12.05 a.m. Eastern Enjoy the fact that Peter Navarro is suffering. <laughs>